Hand of jab from Croix takes the right hand. He's not throwing the jab with confidence, Croix. He's struggling with the range of the oh, right hand. George Croix, timing perfect. Croix on the floor for only the second time. The fact that George Groves hit me with one right hand, no shots before that, then it's probably arguably is the biggest right hand I've ever been hit with. And this place has just become electrified. Well, he's tempted him with his own punches and he paid the penalty. There's that right hand again. And Frosch looks on oh, the no. He was hit after the bell there. What a sensational start. And Frosch looks shaky as he sits down. I feel like it was me against everyone off the bat. If I, Eddie Hearn don't like me. Frotch, he is a, he's a hard case, but I can I can do him. I can beat him. I can box him, but I've got to be switched on, on it to do that. But Frotch smells blood here. Needs to finish it here. It really does. Groves is in trouble. Thing. He's taken another one and another. And Howard Foster has stopped it. Wow. That is going to be controversial. I'll keep saying that I'm lying as such. You know, I'm not confident when I say I'm confident. I'm not ready when I say I'm ready. I think he believes that I'm going to get in there and run from him. But, Carl, you're wrong. I'm going to come out. I'm going to meet you. Centre of the ring, first round. And I'm going to win the jab exchanges. And I'm going to hit you with two right hands. Just two. Just to let you know, whenever I want, I can hit you with a right hand. Second round, I'm going to come out, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to take the centre of the ring. I'm going to win the jab exchanges. And I'm going to hit him with more right hands. Third round, I'm going to come back. Come out, and I'm going to push him back. I'm going to push him on his back foot. And then after the third round, Carl, you're going to have to see what's coming next. It's all down to you from there. Yeah, I mean, I remember that press conference. Yeah, as you were saying it, I can actually, it was playing out in my mind. And um, by that point, the fight was big. You know, we were sold out. The build up had been great. The, the two personalities were just mixing fantastically well. And we were just sitting there, and he just went, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit you with one right hand or whatever it was. And Carl's like looking at me and nudging me and looking at Rob McCracken. And, and I think as well, no, Rob won't mind him. I think Rob, no one liked George from from Frotchy's side. They all thought he was disrespectful and like deluded. And they were like looking at each other, just sort of smirking and laughing. And it was, I don't think sometimes George really knew what he was doing. I, I don't think he went, sat there the night before or a couple of days before and went, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, but he's quite intelligent, George. And like, I don't know whether they were premeditated mind games, but it was so such a weird thing to do that it definitely worked. So when he said he's going to win with two right hands, I just thought, fucking idiot, what's he talking about? Water off a duck back. But I obviously gave him some back and said whatever I said to him. Um, and it was it was quite hostile. There was definitely genuine needle. He didn't like me, and I didn't know why he didn't like me, because we'd helped each other out sparring, but all of a sudden he's, he's in the opposite corner, so he took that as right. I'm going to get in Frotch's head. That's what George does. That's, that's, how, that's how he boxes, and he looks for the right hand. He's quick. He's got a real quick right hand off the, off the jab, and he eases back, and you know he can bring it from anywhere. So that was going to be coming anyway. But um, it was just Carl's mindset at the time. He was really annoyed. He was really... He was really um, Really fuming with Groves, some of the stuff he'd said in the build-up over over the over the weeks and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, I think it kind of went over Carl's head. But to be honest with you, that's what George does. You know, he uses the jab. He sets up the right hand nice. You know, he's decent with the hook. But um, you know, he's jabs and, and right hands. George isn't he? And and you know, and the, the difference with George and other fighters is, is George is really quick and powerful. I mean, I felt like I could share the tactics with him because. They were obvious, you know, I'm going to take centre of the ring, I'm going to back you up, I'm going to land the jab and uh, win the jab exchanges and I'm going to hit you with two right, I'm going to hit you with two right hands. Um, I think I wanted him to think, he probably thought I was going to come in and run like I did with Degel, fight on the back foot, try and be sharp, try and nick a point to win. But that wasn't for me. I thought I'm gonna get in. I'm gonna land on him. I know he'd been dropped before, so he can be hurt. I'm gonna get rid of him. Um, and what a statement! Like what a what a what a, what a beautiful thing. Um, the two right hands becomes like 
in, infamous because he takes it as a double right hand. The point of this exercise the whole time was to convince Carl, and it's always been to convince the fighter, you know, um, at at the risk of alienating yourself, of making yourself a bit of a pantomime villain um, to the boxing fans, uh, to be unliked within the industry um, because they think you're arrogant or you're hard work or you're, you're just obnoxious or un unpredictable. But at that point, it was all about winning. It was all about getting that reaction from Froch. And I wanted him to come out in the first round and go, oh, this fucker's supposed to be running and he's not. Um, and I don't know what McCracken had told him. I don't know what his brother Lee had told him. I don't know what anyone around him had sort of told him. He's, he's, he's training up at GB, I think, at the time. So all the GB lads, you know, some of which are my, you know, my pals, like, you know, who've been around him, Luke Campbell, Anthony Agogo, and I'm thinking, no, I'm going to, he's going to, he's going to sit down at the end of the first round and go, he didn't run. There's a bit, a bit of doubt creeps in. What else did he say? And he said this, and he said this, and he said this. When Groves was telling me he was going to hit me with two right hands, he's going to do this, and uh, that's just, honestly, me and Rob, I don't even think we had a conversation about it. I'm sure we didn't. Rob might tell you different because he might have better memory than me, but I can't remember everything. I, I can remember just saying to Rob, what a prick he is. And Rob's like, well, just giving him stick, just like, fucking, he's unbearable. Like, so it worked, this, it worked the job George had that all I wanted to do was punch him as hard as I can in the face. I never want to do that when I'm fighting. I'm trying to score a jab and set the right hand up and score points. I'm not looking at trying to hurt somebody. But with him, I wanted to hurt him. <laughs> and it, um, it doesn't help you. Let me tell you, you've got to hold your nerve and you've got to be disciplined in the boxing ring. You've got to get behind your jab and you've got to set your work up and set little traps and work your opponent out. It's the art of pugilism. It's, it's the sweet science. And um, that first fight with Groves, it rattled me. On the afternoon before the fight at Manchester Central, the Saint, George Groves, weighed in at 11 stones, 12 pounds, to a chorus of boos. Carl the Cobra Froch was 11.13. Would you please welcome to the scales, undefeated in 19 contests, 19 wins, 15 inside, the the scales of the two-time ABA general, the former undefeated British and Commonwealth Super Middleweight Champion and the reigning WBA Intercontinental Super Middleweight Champion from Hammersmith, London, England, St. George Super middleweight champion, the former WBC super middleweight champion of the world, and now the reigning and defending WBA and IBF super middleweight champion of the world from Nottingham, England, the Cobra. Froch at 36 was being paid a reported two and a half million pounds. Groves, his 25-year-old mandatory challenger, a career-high 800,000. All that remained was for them to show up and fight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the ring the challenger, George Groves! Well, he's reveled in his role as the bad guy, hasn't he? And he's been reaping the reward of that right here. Just listen to those boos. But George Groves, as you heard, is made of stern stuff. Physically powerful, mentally tough. Some people think he's not up to this. There's no doubt whatsoever in George's mind that tonight there's going to be a changing of the guard.
but the one thing he doesn't have is world championship experience and Jim it's going to be fascinating to see how he handles the occasion I noticed in the build-up when my mum was a bit nervous with how I was acting and she's like oh you know can't you basically like can't you just be a bit nicer and um I said to her I said mum don't worry I said mum we know what we're doing like and the truth is, no one ever does. Though it's just like it's all on a whim, it's all on a, on a gut feeling. I was like, they'll. I said, she said they'll boo me on the way in, they'll cheer me on the way out. Like they don't know what what's coming. They they don't know. They they've been fed these lies from everyone. You know, they think they've forgotten about me basically. Um, and that, I suppose that's just you know. That's just when she gets the bus to work, she can or she bumps into her mate. They're like, George is fighting, you know. Um, and and they're, the, you know, the family and friends and, you know, long-time sort of followers, they're the ones you love the most because sometimes it doesn't occur to you that the brunt that they've had to face, you know, uh, on the way um, when I've when I've sort of been ruthless and, and all in for the cause. Um but I, I got to be honest. I was I was a little bit shocked at, at how vehemently I was received in the in the stadium when when the ring walk starts. And I've come to learn that you know boos um, ring much louder than cheers. But it was you know it was like they were spitting venom at me for that build up uh, for the ring walk, and I was thinking. Oh wow! This is really, it's really intense. I was like, well, I'm sure, I'm sure it's just that crowd. We've we've split the crowd as casuals, and then he comes out and they're all cheering him. And I was like, ah, oh, this is okay. So this is mob mentality. Like this, everyone's bought a ticket. They've seen the preview, and now they want they want to watch the spectacle. But um, I wasn't fussed. Like I wasn't worried that oh, it's gonna play an effect on the fight. Um, or it's going to keep them it's going to keep Frotch going as such you know because they didn't quite feel or maybe I rightly or wrongly I didn't think they were that crowd I didn't think they were the Ricky Hatton crowd who were going to you know proud for him to go out on his sword and cheer him on I thought I'm going to convince this crowd I'm going to convert this crowd um, so they're not going to be cheering Frotch on to his to his last sort of punch you know till he's counted out they're gonna I'm gonna be able to, to switch him up do I think it affected him well he put up a pretty good performance didn't he so but if it had a effect I think it'll have an effect on anybody anybody you're walking in and uh, you're getting booed but um, it's how he held his composure that was impressive but it will have an effect if a fighter gets hit with a good shot even if he holds his com composure, is what the key is. It doesn't mean he didn't feel the shot, does it? So, had an effect on him. My concern came probably a little bit before that, 10 minutes before that. I've not seen Carl look so, oh, I don't know, like unbothered, unmotivated, uh, like in a changing room before. And every fight that Frotch has been in, he's literally, like, of, of magnitude, he's literally, his nostrils are, like, fle he's, like, hyperventilating. <sighs> like, Butte, Kessler, same thing. Like, walk from the change room to behind the curtain, ready to ring wall. Just, like, you can't talk to him. And I'll never forget, he left that changing room, and as he was walking, he went, to, to behind the stage you went me is it cold in here and I was like no 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 it's alright and he just you know it was like oh like and I just thought to myself hmm like at the time I didn't think too much because I, I just honestly presumed that he was going to smash George but and then after you look back and you just think now was that the mind games was that he just wasn't really up for it against George or he thought it was going to you know, he definitely thought that fight was over inside six rounds. But he just wasn't, it wasn't the fearful frotch that made him so dangerous. 
No, it was very cold in there, but if, as cold as it is, when you warmed up properly and you're on it, you, you warm up, you put a hoodie on if you have to, and you, you, you do your bit of skipping or a bit of shadow boxing, then you go on the pads and you, you get warm very quick because your heart rate goes up. Just like physiologically, you're warm and ready. Um, and no, when I got to the changing rooms in Manchester, I was like, bloody hell, it's freezing in there. Like, I didn't want to start getting ready, but I was a bit nervous thinking, fuck me, it's, it's fight night. You always get a bit nervous, fight night anyway. And then Rob's wrapping my hands up and I could feel myself shivering. So it was definitely cold. Um, and then I was slowly warming up, slowly put my boots on, slowly got my box protector on. And, and I was doing a bit of jumping around and shadow boxing. I just couldn't get into it. But I think the reality had set in that actually Groves ain't a bad fight. He's gone the distance with James DeGale and won a, won a put close points decision. DeGale's a gold medalist. DeGale can fight, can't he? He's, he's not dedicated enough. And I've never really thought highly of him because I, I, I think you should respect the sport more than the way he did I mean I think I think he was a good fighter and a good talent and when George beat him I thought yeah good good win that really Dece decent fight for Groves to win and all these questions and doubts and demons were fucking talking to me in the changing rooms and I was freezing I couldn't warm up and um, yeah I did I said to Eddie on the way through is it cold in here because I was freezing still um, but in my head I was thinking I've not done enough sparring. Checking my diary the night before the fight, looking through my diary, going, I've only done 60 rounds of sparring ish. He's do 120. I haven't done that Rocky run. It's called the Rocky run around the loop road because you've got the old industrial bit that looks like Rocky one when he's running through the train lines. And I've got like Rocky run, I've got um, Donkey Hill, which is a, which is an horrible big hill run, um, Collet Park loop road run. And then there's all different runs names, so I know which runs which and how far they are. And that rocky run, I was like two minutes outside my best time. And I've got to hit that time, and two minutes is fucking miles away. 20 seconds is a long time on a run when you're running six miles. But two minutes, I was like, oh, the hell. not only was I two minutes behind, I was knackered. So I'm a long way off where I need to be, but it's only a run. In my head, I'm thinking it's only a run. But I knew that I wasn't as fit as I should have been but I've got this refusal to quit and I've got this experience and I'm a seasoned professional and I've got all these world title fights behind me and if I need to draw on it, all right, I'll be more tired and I'll feel a bit more exhausted, but that's not going to stop me. So George Grove still got a good version of me, but the ring walk was cold, the demons were creeping in and I wanted to knock him out as quick as possible. I wanted to hit him on the chin as hard as possible, as early as possible and that's what I did from round one, try to iron him out early. You weren't happy in the changing room. Look, it is what it is. Um, we've got through the training camp. Um, he knows he's got a fight. Um, he's fit. He's he's he's. I mean, compare compare him to normal fighters. He's fitter than any. You know, he's fitter than ninety five percent of them. But you know what? He's gone into the fight, peed off. He's not fully motivated, and now it's on him. It's like, oh, shit, I've got a fight now and I'm walking to the ring. I don't feel great. And and he shouldn't have felt great because he wasn't, you know, you know, he wasn't where he should have been. He should have been clear-minded, looking forward to the fight, not annoyed and, and begrudgingly taking a fight with somebody that he felt, you know, hadn't done what he'd done to get into that position. So in my head, I wasn't fully ready because walking to the ring on the first gross fight, I didn't feel good. It's time to meet the champion. Well, here comes the Cobra yet again. World title fight number 11. After five years mixing in the very highest company. You have to go back to the amateur days to find the last time he lost to a fellow Brit. But you also have to go back a few years to find the last time Carl Froch looked good against a young, fresh, aggressive prospect. And it'll be fascinating to see how he deals with the challenge of an opponent who comes in with all the ambition of youth. Again, Groves, composed, stole the moment. In the seconds before the opening bell, he stood in the centre of the ring, staring at Froch. The champion was in his corner, surrounded by ten of his people, including brother Lee, McCracken and Tony Sims. Across the ring, behind Groves, there was only Fitzpatrick and Luke Watkins, the amateur boxer he was working with. Groves had chosen to stand alone. This was one final chance to get deeper under Froch's skin. And when we're standing in the ring, you know, it's only really when you see the pictures after 
of that. But at the time, not really. Because you've got to understand, Froch was the superstar and George was just the opponent. So the fact that he had him two people in the ring and a couple down by the bucket, didn't really, like, you see that quite a lot. But it's only like the overhead shot of when he was standing there. And of course, through the performance and the drama that you look back at those kind of images and think, yeah, it was him against the world. I can remember still feeling a bit nervous, still feeling a bit unsure. Can't wait for the bell to go. Didn't want to look at him because every time I looked at him, he was giving me that stare down. I was thinking, I'm even, I'm getting more fuming. Because I even said to Rob, I don't know if Rob's remembered it, but I was like saying, oh, was it to leave? It was either Rob or Lee because my memory's a little bit um, hazy. And it's not, it's not a vivid memory of that fight because I got hit that much. I was quite heavily concussed. When Groves was stood there with his chest pumped up and his chin in the air looking at me like fucking Hercules, I was thinking, fucking prick, look at him. Even down to like now in the ring, he's still, he's still, but he brought it and he brought it well and he was confident. But now I was still fuming. So I couldn't wait for that first bell to go so I could punch him in the face. And um, yeah, he'd, he'd done a really good job. So, I mean, I end up in the ring and I've got Paddy with me. I've got Barry O'Connell in the corner. Um, got Mick Williamson in the corner doing cuts. I've got um, Luke Watkins. He wasn't a pro yet, um, but he's just a um, lovely lad. Trained in the gym with Paddy. Uh, and Paddy said, oh, we'll bring Luke. He can help with security. And... I was like, all right. Uh, to be honest, the decision was I thought I thought Paddy Paddy could do with a familiar face on his, you know with him. So much of this was sort of just me, my people. In I felt like yeah, if he's got one of his lads, his student as such, you know who he's who he's he's teaching to box, who's there, who can absorb the atmosphere, learn like I learned being in the slipstream with David Hay on the big nights. It will serve him well surf Paddy well and, and he looks the part because he's a big old cruiserweight uh, so he's in the ring but <coughs> Frotch ring walks and as what happens I'm sure everyone wants to be part of the Frotch party now do you know what I mean and they all just dive in the ring you know he's got I thought he had like eight brothers at the time but I think it's only two brothers um, one of his good mates and then any other sort of passers by will manage to grab a t-shirt and jump in and um so I sort of creep a step or so forward and I'm on my own, I'm standing, I'm staring. I'm just like, right, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And in my mind, I'm thinking, I hope this looks fucking cool on TV. Like, hope I hope what I'm trying to portray is going to be seen. Like, it's dead still and calm in our corner. Like, we, we're, we're waiting, like, patiently and we've been waiting patiently and we're ready to go. Um, and I can't get to Frotch. Like, there's there's like a... It's almost like a military sort of operation that they had sort of, there was like flanks of Rose and then McCracken and Froch in the in the very corner. So you couldn't see through the sea of heads in his corner to get to him. Because um, I, I thought, he's just that man. He's that guy. If, if I catch eyes with him, he's not going to look away. He's going to have to step forward and, and try and get in, get, get in line. And if he doesn't, he's going to think, I think he's he's wussed out, you know, he's he's lost his bowl and that was like for him, he's not that sort of man, he won't be able to cope with that. But I don't get to him. Uh we touch gloves and, and the fight starts. Uh, you both in the dressing room, you both know I expect. Keep it clean, break straight away when told. Both you watch your heads in close, good luck to you both, touch gloves. Good luck, lads. Well, finally, the talking stops. This one's been building and building. So, too, has the sense of anticipation in this arena. Carl Froch, been here, seen it, done it so many times. No mystery about him. What about this fella? How will he cope with the pressure? Jim, I've been watching him really closely during the preliminaries. He looks absolutely fine. I think we've got two guys in here, Jim, that both believe this is going to be their night. I've been impressed all the way through with Groves, even more impressed now. Frotch has tried to strike terror into his heart over the last few weeks. Hasn't worked. He's up for it. Well, there's the Groves jab early. It's a big weapon of his. It's varied and it's spiteful. I'm having success in the first round. He just thinks, right, it's almost like that, like a 10th round sort of breathe in and go and he sort of breathes in and he goes across his legs he walks onto a you know a really good right hand um and he's he's on his way over and he's he's over he's on his way down
first round, I was behind the jab. I knew that he'd got a fast jab because I'd sparred him. I knew it was tricky. He was being even more tricky, doing his little fake, fake twitch, twitch, what Adam Booth taught him, and shimmy, shimmy, one, two, all that bollocks, um, like Shane Mosley. And he was doing all that, and I thought, yeah, I'm not buying your face. Just keep my right hand in front of my face. I, I didn't have a bad round till the knockdown. I was, I, was, I was doing what I wanted to do. I was kind of landing the odd body shot. Up close, I was feeling his strength and not really getting caught much. And then as he backed me up to the ropes, I hit him with a short le- little bit of an uppercut shot. I thought I'd caught him. In my head, I thought, oh, I've caught him with something. And as soon as I've caught somebody, I'll go there and go for the finish. But it was round one. I should have just hit him with that shot that half hit him and got back behind my jab, but I rushed forward, because I was that eager to try and punch him in the face again. Um, I just left my feet behind, came square on, and missed with a right hand, fell really short of a right hand, and walked onto a nice sweet little one-two, and the right hand that Groves hit me with, boom, straight on the side of the chin. I saw it coming, um, because I knew I'd left myself short, and then I couldn't remember then, it was like I was in front of Howard Foster, on my feet, that's the only bit I can remember being all. I can't remember going down, so I was obviously half asleep. For the tentative jab from Croix, takes the right hand. He's not throwing the jab with confidence for Arch. He's struggling with the range of the jab. Oh, he's been nailed. Right hand. George Groves, timing perfect. Brought on the floor for only the second time. What a shock. And this place has just become electrified. I've never felt so nut like at that point at that point like when he landed the shot it was like everything went in slow motion boom and Froch, you know down on the floor and I'm just like I mean bear in mind at the time I'd seen a lot in boxing certainly growing up but as the lead promoter sitting there I've never really seen anything like it and Froch was of course our flagship guy Sky's flagship guy and I was just like you know, and luckily his conditioning and his fitness got him up. But back in those days, we didn't have the big screens with the timers on. So I had no idea how long was left in the round. And luckily it was only, what, 20, 30 seconds or whatever it was. And he just went back to his corner and I was just sort of staring at him, just trying to see if he was okay. But at that point, probably thought the fight was over. I mean, it was that big a shot, that big a knockdown, you really worry that a fighter can recover in one minute you could feel the shot i could really feel how crisp the shot went in and landed uh and i just remember it's just muscle memory it's just like what's drilled into you right straight away neutral corner i'll look to mine to see what paddy's got to say um i've got full trust in him at this point i think see what he says does he say get back on him he say just let go does he say target the body and say twitch him up like um let's see what let's see what paddy says um frotch makes the count and then um but i just come out i think right, i'm gonna faint him faint him faint him i want him to engage again so i can hit him um i'm gonna hit him on the bell i actually catch him on the bell which was like almost perfect for me i want him to come away and sit down and go fuck if we're allowed to swear be like whoa what happened there? What is this? Um, trying to drown him as much as possible in that first round. I could just remember Howard Foster um, just in front of me. And I was like, yep, Sam, no problem. Oop, fell back onto the ropes. No, I'm sweet, I'm sweet. Come on, let's go. <laughs> and um, fucking hell, it was at the end of the round, wasn't it? So F- Foster box, he said Howard Foster referee box. We came together and I just thought, cheeky cunt, let me smack him. I just dropped the C word then. I was fuming. And um, I tried to load up with a left hook, a right hook, a left hook. And actually, I was a split second behind George Groves. He hit him with a left hook, right or left hook. So he caught me with three or four more shots. The bell went. I heard it. I kind of switched off, which you should never do. And he hit me with another one or two when the bell had gone. So I took them back to the corner with me and um, sat down on my stool and faced the ref of Ron McCracken. Well, he's tempted up with his own punches and he paid the penalty. Does that right hand again? And Frosch looks on his body in the night. He was hit after the bell there. What a sensational start. And Frosch looks shaky as he sits down. And Rob McCracken is going to have to give one of the great talks in one minute. But what can he do to turn this around? Because Frosch looks all over the place in there. The fact that George Groves hit me with one right hand and no shots before that, then it's probably arguably is the biggest right hand I've ever been hit with. No, it was a big shot and he went down. It was a heavy shot. But um, he's he's got really, really good recovery powers. But... Um, 
It's it's funny because yeah, it's a big shot from George, but Carl recovered, sat on the stool, and he was clear eyed. He was like, "Yeah, I'm fine. I know what I've done." Um, just you know, like trying to get through a fog, and he's just started off slow, and he's been caught early, which is the worst time in pro boxing. You get caught in the first two or three rounds when you're not fully bang on it. It's dangerous. I'm caught cool. business as usual. You know, like don't don't get high on it. Don't get too excited. I'm like, I'm gonna get rid of this guy. I've already dropped him in the first round. He will go. Like, don't be impatient. Don't waste energy i always tried to be an efficient fighter by this point in my career bad start to what i knew was probably going to be a tough fight because my training didn't go how it was how it went but i was still in my head thinking as soon as i catch him on the chin as soon as i hit george groves on the chin in my head he'll go over i'll hurt him i'll put him over i was getting caught with shots i was probably losing the rounds but there was more close rounds in there than what than what i thought after the fight, when I watched it back, I was like, oh, I was actually getting to him. Packed him. There was moments when he was on the ropes and I was putting two or three body shots together. Then there was moments when he was trying to hold and I pushed him off. And it was getting messy and rough in there. Bad as it was, that woke me up. You know what I mean? That got me in the room. That was like, okay, now I'm in a fight here. And I was able to draw on all the previous experience at world level where I'd been knocked down by Jermaine Taylor. And, um, you know what I mean? I'd been, I'd been hurt by Johnson and um, Kessler, and I lost to Kessler, and I didn't go over, but I was out on my feet a couple of times with Kessler, because I felt knackered in, in the first round, but yeah, I came out from round two, just thinking, right, don't force anything, don't leave, I didn't feel gone in my legs, I didn't feel like I was vulnerable, because I've got a mega chin, I've got really good powers of recovery, and I just didn't feel hurt, I didn't feel like, oh no, I'd better not get hit with another one, because like when I've hurt an opponent, I always think, right, I hit him with another one because he'll probably he's probably on his way out. He's probably going to go. And when you watch him boxing, as an as a as a experienced fight fan or a fighter, you know that once somebody's been hit and hurt, they're ready to go. They're, they're like the stamina bar on that game's down at the bottom, and ready to be knocked out. Um, but I didn't feel like I was vulnerable. I just felt solid on my feet. The minute rest had recovered me, so I went and met fire with fire again in round two, and I just thought I'll catch him but I was a split second behind him again, and he was catching me, and I couldn't get anything going. Been through a number of world title fights with him in training camps and camps before, but um, I know what he's about. I know what's in him, and um, he's an, he is an out-and-out -out fighter, and I knew that if if me and him talk, talk to each other, uh, he'd work his way back into it and he'd get through it. As much as a bad night this was going to be, he wasn't really on it. His timing wasn't great, and um, he was forcing things and giving away shots. But um, sometimes, you know, you've got to you've got to dig in and you've got to get yourself back into it. And um, it was going to be an hard night, uh, two to six. But um, he responded. Yeah, he got caught with plenty of shots. But um, you're going to get it sometimes in professional boxing. Um, you know, I've watched I've watched great fighters. Uh, and you're surprised how many times they get it in it in pro in world title fights, but they're fighting really good fighters as well. So he was always going to have to dig his way back in after the knockdown, and he responded really well. We was talking; he was clear on the stool every round, and uh, he was determined to work his way back into it and win the fight. And and that 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 that's Carl. Years later, it would be the corner work of McCracken that contributed so much to Anthony Joshua's survival after he was knocked down by Vladimir Klitschko. But on this occasion, Groves, excited and winning over the 21,000 crowd, as he had promised, built momentum and grew in confidence through the opening five rounds. The sixth was the most punishing of Frotch's career. Groves simply couldn't miss with his explosive right hand. The first thing coming out for the second round is get through this round. You know, you, you've been badly hurt in the first round. Is George going to stick it on him? George stuck it on him, but he was still a little bit cautious, obviously. He knew that Frotch had recovered a little bit. And Carl started to find his way back in the fight. Then George came back, and as, as you said, I think the sixth round, he just hit him with a kitchen sink. Frotch is the one grabbing hold there. It's normally the opponent. The only way they can cope with the strength in Frotch. They have a right hand, terrific right hand again. He felt and it, Jim, he felt it. <laughs> terrific powers of recovery always. But the punches that catch you high, the punches in the jaw you recover quickly from, the ones that catch you high can have a stunning effect and it takes a little bit of time for the head to clear. That was a terrific shot, there's more, another one! Another one, and three more, and this is big stuff from George Groves, huge right hands! He has outfought Carl Froch in that bus, he completely outfought him! And he picked every one of those shots so clingy and accurately. 
And he's just growing in confidence if that's possible. And Frost walks on to more and more. He can't miss with the right hand. There it goes again. He can't miss. He shouldn't throw anything else. You just wonder how much even a real tough guy like Carl Frost can take of this. Another big right hook getting through there. This is a huge round for George Groves at a time when I thought Froch's experience would get him into the fight. There it goes again. Defence is non-existent. This is turning into a night of disaster for Carl Froch. And the worst could be yet to come. Missed that time. Froch on him straight away, but couldn't sustain the assault. And George Groves dropped his gloves and said, come on. What a terror. Frotch is giving it everything now. But can he land anything clean? Huge pressure. But anything getting through, a right hand I think might have done. But he's still ducking and swaying and then boring him with the head. Groves. You are seeing the foolishness of youth there. We're just seeing the foolishness of youth. That was crazy stuff there from George Groves. He's been so disciplined. I don't believe he did that. He's winning the round with tremendous right hands in this. All he has to do is see the round out and put another one in the bank. Take a rest, get your breath back. Lovely job. Frotch coming forward more and more. But things are getting desperate for him. From round sort of two to six, um, it's just keep building on that. Keep keep looking for them openings. Um Know that he's a fit fighter, a strong fighter, and he might he might try and come again. Um, but six, I really wanted to sort of hammer him. Really, I think I, I land, I land, and I get a reaction um, in the sixth round, and I'm like, okay, let's throw caution to the wind. Let's let's use a lot of energy in this round and put a significant dent in him. And I do. I throw a lot of right hands, probably. Too many right hands, very right hand happy, same shot, but I'm not missing with it. But he's definitely been punch numb at this at this point. He wasn't hurting him as much as obviously he did in the first round. And I just there was always question marks over Groves' stamina. And I just felt as this fight kept going into deeper, deeper waters, it would give Carl Froch every advantage down the stretch. And I, I just wanted George to just keep throwing, keep throwing, and and Carl. But it was like that sixth round that it was like actually, you know, once Carl got through three rounds, I thought he'll we'll be okay here. He'll just find a way. And then when George came back in that sixth, it was like oh my god, like has he got anything left after that? But when you're up close like that, you start seeing the thuds land and looking at the face a little bit more, and you see the body shots land and and just. The body language change a little bit from Groves. Still in there. You know, he wasn't done. He wasn't spent. But just starting to get worn down by by the relentlessness of Froch and having to throw so many punches to keep him off. And we sit down sit down at the end of the six and Paddy tells me to have the seventh off, um, which I still think is the right move. The right move. And maybe I could have been a little bit more um, busier in that seventh. But I had to expend a lot of energy in the six, had the seventh off, and then come back. I think I still win this, this the seventh. Do you know what I mean? I'm still in full control. Um, but at that point, like we're building into the second half of the fight, and um, I was, I'm thinking I must be a mile ahead on the scorecards, maybe rounds three or four or even. But other than that, you know, if I've been dominating, and he's just had a, a, a terrible six round. Part of me was thinking, like, do I? He's that fighter where he's. He needs anything to feel like a positive and he's going to come again um, and don't give him anything. Like it was all about not giving him nothing. But be sharp and clean and seventh, if he gets through the seventh, um, just, yeah, get 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 your, um, have a round off. So round six wasn't that bad up until the point where it was right towards the end of the round. I stayed in range. So I was getting closer and closer to him, getting my feet a bit more to him but without him backing off and running off. And when, I, when I'm able to stay in range to my opponent, I let them fire off, block a couple of shots or get hit with a couple of shots, but they're still in range to be hit back. And then I'd throw a couple of big shots back. And I can remember in round six, getting closer to him and landing a few body shots and getting him around the side of the gloves and around the side of the head. 
but the finish to round six was awful. It was a terrible round because I got hit with left hook, right hook, left hook, right hook. I got absolutely clattered at the end of that round. So whether that's the bad, worst round of my career, who knows? But it, it was. It felt like a really bad round and a round that I got hit with a lot of conse- consecutive punches with um, at the end of that round. So maybe I could feel during the seventh round that George Groves was fading. So I even mentioned it to Rob McCracken. The, I don't know if I said he's gone or he's tiring, but Rob was like, yeah, I know he is, but don't get careless and, and whatever. But I could feel that George Groves was starting to fade. And I always I always feel good when the opponent starts to weaken because I'm always a strong finisher. So I could sense that Groves was fading. I mentioned it to Rob. And um, yeah, that was for me, that was the start of me really going for it then and, and being confident I was going to get the finish. It wouldn't be him if he couldn't get through that, he wouldn't be there. It would be someone else who was there and, and he can do that and he can he can ride out storms. He can ride out a storm for two rounds or six rounds, but he'll ride it out and then he'll he'll, he'll get to you and, he, and, and he'll win. What followed remains the subject of debate. Regardless of whether Groves, in his own words, took the round off, Froch remarkably started to recover and grow. Groves, oozing in confidence, began showboating against an opponent whose trainer by then believed he needed a knockout to avoid defeat. Groves was also guilty of a longer-term habit of moving to the ropes. I remember at this point feeling tired, feeling tired. Um, but I don't think there's... That's a, I don't think that's a bad thing, really. It's been a physical fight. It's been a, It's a big fight. Um, he must be exhausted as well. I think his style, you know, the way he shapes up, the way he holds his stance, he doesn't look as tired as I am. But and he's and he's likely a, a fitter athlete than I am. But um, I'm still the the powerful guy, the explosive guy, doing the explosive movements, and still making him miss. And he's not having really any success at this point. It was, like now he gets told that there was a, there's a there's a change in the tide, but it feels to me like it was just that he wasn't getting hammered as badly as he was in the first say six rounds. And I am a championship fighter; I had been twelve rounds. I thought if he can cl- if 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 he can get if he can get around George and hit him to the body and and start pushing and shoving him a little bit and and keeping him off you know keeping him off balance a little bit. But he's heavy handed, Carl. And um, people don't, you know, they might know that, they, they should do, but he's heavy-handed and he hits you with two or three, he slows you down a little bit and then he gets you, you know, he gets your shot, sucks around the side of the head and hits you underneath. Um, he can start to have an effect instantly and, and as the fight went on, um, he started to have an effect. You could see it, you could see the fight slowly changing and, and I felt he was changing. Yeah, I do think it started a shift, but I think people have a misperception of how it started a shift. Um, it started a shift. He had a, he had a great sixth round. Um, he beat Carl at his own game. He traded with him more than beat him off the end of the jab. Um, went out in the seventh. The people have the think that George made the mistake of going to Carl. He went to Carl in the first round. Do they not remember? He said, I'll take center rim and back you up. He backed him up for six rounds. In the seventh round, then he decided to bring Carl in. At the end of the seventh round, I said, I know you feel in control, but don't let this dude think that he's backing you up. Because even though you're bringing him to you, it looks different. So go back and give me the first round again in round eight. So he went out uh, in round eight and did box more, but still didn't go back to exactly what we had. So there was a shift. But hey, man, we're supposed to be getting ready to fight the best in the world. That's what this is about, world champions. I mean, was both starting to fade, both starting to slow down, but I could feel the the power of his punches were, were getting weaker. And when I was in close with him and, and getting hold of him and pushing him off me, it was easier to sort of throw around and lean back. And he was looking to get out of the out of the way rather than stay in range a little bit more. He sat on the ropes and he dropped his arms and, and give it... Because I'd hit him with about three or four shots around the body and the head. Then I was swinging over the top trying to hit him on the... Just still trying to chin him <laughs> in round seven or round eight, whenever it was. And... Um, he sort of rolled, give it the give it the old brick top shoulder roll a couple of times, and he was it was it was making a miss, and um, yeah, then he dropped his arms and um, he he just did a bit of a silly showboat dance. I think he did, but it was nothing. It was like 
me just thinking, you're doing that because you know you're in trouble. That's how, that's what I read from that. Yeah, it just felt that Carl was starting to get on top, you know, and, and George was still having plenty of success, but Carl was having success and he didn't have a lot of success in the fight up until the halfway stage, really. But just, as I said, started to land more, started to look stronger. George, when George starts to unravel, it's quite noticeable. He was getting marked up, you know, his hair was all like, like he just looked tired. And you started to think Frotch could come on strong here. I'm saving plenty for 10, 11, 12. Um, I will go out on my shield, you know, in this fight. It's, it's my, my life, my existence up until this point has all been for this moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I the way I see it is just that he wasn't getting as as, as much of a beat in, in the, you know, the seventh, eighth and maybe ninth as he was earlier on in the fight. But I always find it quite unfair to say that as a, a changing of the sort of the tide, like basically like he's coming to get me. Um, because, yeah, I just, I don't, don't, I just don't see it that way. Groves has been on him right from the start and made him fight in every round. The pace is slowing down now. So, oh, beautiful shots again from Groves. Oh, Frotch knows Left they're coming, but he can't get out of the way. And there was a little left hook got thrown in there just for good measure as well. Well, Frotch certainly has proved his toughness. He says he can't be knocked out. I'm beginning to believe him because he's been hit with several knockout punches. And they're still oh. coming. Still coming from Groves. And still, Frotch is standing tall. And then lands a right hand of his own. And Groves has wobbled. Groves is in big trouble now. And Frotch senses it. And Frotch is going for the finish because Groves' legs have gone. And Groves hanging on here, just holding and spoiling, trying to buy some time. But Frotch smells blood here. I think Frotch needs to finish it here. He really does. Groves, Groves is, is in trouble. Thing. He's taken another one and another. And Howard Foster has stopped it. Wow, that is going to be controversial. Groves is disgusted. Groves is furious. And there's going to be some controversy here. Frotch had him in trouble, no question about that. But he was so far ahead, George Groves. Was he in so much trouble that it required a stoppage? That's the question that's going to be asked over and over again. Almost everybody believes that referee Howard Foster prematurely intervened to rescue Groves from further punishment. And almost all of those recognize that Groves was indeed hurt. Opinion, though, is divided as to whether Froch was absolutely on the cusp of the most memorable of comeback victories or if Groves would have, as former trainer Adam Booth, watching from ringside, suggested, resisted Froch's attack and survived. David Hay, a long-term friend of Froch, also spent years training alongside Groves, and that night in Manchester, he also condemned the stoppage. I have no doubts that Carl Froch was on his way to winning that fight. No doubts. But yes, I think the stoppage was early. I mean, I must have watched it a thousand times now. On the night, it happened right in front of me. It was on my side. And Carl hit him with the right hand, and he stumbled back to the ropes and we all sort of half stood up to say this is it and then he hit him you know he was unloading and Frotch, Carl, Carl sometimes scrappy with his work and it was just the left hook I believe that made George almost in trading that made him sort of slump and then Howard just jumped in and George was a little bit lucky at that point because it looked like Howard jumping in had made him stumble back. But he was hurt and he was tired. But bearing in mind the way the fight had gone and bearing in mind what was at stake, I think it was four, five, six punches too early. But I also have no doubt that he was going to go on and stop him in any which way from there. I hit him with a big overhand right that never gets shown on the, sh on the, on the show reel. I hit him with an overhand right hand. My arms were down. I was walking to his left 
just sort of setting him up, thinking he's going to come in a minute. He's going to come round. And I threw an overhand right, caught him. I ate Alan Page with the same overhand right hand for the English title years ago. Hit him with that and he was gone. And it was a similar little tricky shot. And George's legs went and he grabbed hold of me. Like, and the referee was like breaking up. And as soon as I pushed him off me, because the ref didn't get in before I pushed him off, I then I some rushed him. I sort of ran at him really unprofessional but I, I wasn't worried about what was coming back because I knew George was really faded and gone at this stage but I caught him with that overhand right and then ran to him ran into him and um, smothered my work but pushed him back onto the ropes like tried to hit him with a shot I kind of missed but then shoved him back like mauled him manhandled him into the ropes and then when he was against the ropes still struggling from that shot I just hit him with that Howard Foster seen because when I hit him with that Howard Foster if you look he jumped in between us and had a look and he was like looking thinking because Howard Foster's a very experienced referee and knows what he's doing and he could see that Groves was hurt and then when I had him against the ropes I hit him with a right I missed with a couple of shots but I'm going to tell you about the ones that hit him it was a straight right left hook and then there was a couple of misses and then as he came towards me I hit him with another left hook and his head sort of snapped back he had his arms out looking to reach and grab for me I had just dragged my feet back a little bit give myself a bit of distance I hit him with a left hook and he fell into me and grabbed hold of me but then as the ref came in, George Groves' arms were slumped by his side and his head was down. And Howard Foster managed to get him sort of in a headlock because George Groves' head was that low. Howard Foster didn't have him that way. He had him with his hand below his waist with George Groves in a headlock, taking him sort of away from me. Groves' hands are both by his side. He's slumped over and his head's down. And he's got his back to me at this stage. So... Yeah, the fight could have gone on for another couple of seconds and he'd have got knocked out and badly hurt. There's, that fight was only going one way and yes the fight could have been justifiably stopped which in my opinion it was the referee stopped the fight because he knew George was hurt and he knew he just took two or three clean shots and he was on his way out um, but if I'm there as a fan a paying customer that fight should have gone on and uh, and you want to see that conclusive finish you want to know if George Groves could have survived the round and go on to win on points because he wasn't going to knock me out if he was going to knock me out he'd have done it in the first six rounds or you want to know if I could have finished him off conclusively and got the proper stoppage where the where the, where the crowd cheering instead of booing me, and um, or knocked him out. Um, but we didn't get that chance. The stoppage for me was um, bizarre. Like, the stoppage for me was bizarre. I couldn't. I just couldn't believe what had happened. I just it made absolutely no sense to me. It felt like a conspiracy. It felt like right. Uh, any moment that was possible because of the way this fight was going, Frosch was never going to win on, on the points that they've made decision to, to rob me of what, you know, what I've worked my entire life for. Um, I was devastated. Um, in terms of the, the, the physical fight, I wasn't worried at all. It's not like, you know, fighters know, oh, I better punch back or, you know, the referee's going to jump in here or I've got... No more free shots. Don't do this. Don't do that. Um, granted, like I can't physically see myself, but I do know that you know I got pasty pale skin that goes red when I'm hot and bothered and been, and been punched. Uh, my nose has been broke since like 2011, so my mouth is open, which obviously makes you look more tired. You're trying to breathe in air. Um, I've got this sort of like relaxed stance that at times can look sort of hunched over like you're sort of tired but the rounds under the back and yeah sure it's not you know immaculate posture but it's been a physical fight so it's, it's round nine um but i think i'm doing well i think I'm winning this round and as i say i'm think i'm planning to build into these championship rounds like he's always been talking about getting me a championship fighter you know he's he's thinking he's going to get me in the 11th he's not thinking he's going to get me in the ninth like he's thinking he's going to get me late championship rounds and i know i'm going to be fit and fresh and and give it to him as you know as, as best you possibly can um i'm making a miss i'm landing on him he's landed a few on me but nothing that sort of nothing that's stiff in the legs nothing that's wobbled like um as i say part of the part of the tactics was when we come close i'm gonna grab him i'm gonna hold um and then wait for the referee to separate us because i can win I can win this fight at mid to long range. Um, the shorter range, I don't want to give away any free shots. Um, and at the point of the stoppage, he doesn't land anything clean on me. He doesn't land a big shot. Like, there's... 
I'm punching like even if you shorten it right down to the clip of the last time we come together and there's punches thrown. I catch one, he misses one, I slip one, I punch back, you know, all the things that means I'm still in the fight. And Howard Foster just bizarrely and randomly just calls a halt to the action. It's almost like he, did, he I don't know why he did it. It was impulsive of his. To, he just felt like he had to break up the action there. And then, and then his muscle memories kicked in and he's realised, well, if I'm, if I'm breaking it up, then I've got to have to stop the bout. But it come out of the blue. There was no warning. There was, it was absolutely nothing. And no reason to stop the fight. Um, you know, people will say one, one punch too early rather than one punch too late, but he hadn't even landed a shot on me that had shown any real effect. Apart from I'm looking a bit tired, but I'm sure he is tired as well, Carl. Um, still the worst stoppage I've ever seen, like, and I'm sure I'm biased, but it's the worst stoppage I've ever seen. Um in a in in a in a well titled pay per view fight, and th- and these things make a difference. You know, they do make a difference. If I'm a if I'm a journeyman on the undercard of a non TV fight against a prospect, and they stop it a bit early and he's hard done by, people will go, yeah, you're cool, and you get forgotten about, and cram your river and get your violin out. But this is pay per view, sold out the Manchester Arena is the biggest fight of the year, um, in the most entertaining, as, you know high profile you know build up that's been delivering and sympathy goes to Frotch sometimes when I listen to him that if he believes he could have got a conclusive ending he was robbed of that chance that was not his fault he didn't ask Howard Foster to stop the fight um, but I don't for one second buy into like one punch too early is better than one punch too late because it makes zero sense when applied to our fight considering not just that Carl was knocked down heavy in the first round and gets up because he beats the count he's fully entitled to still be in that fight but he's punched senseless for most of the fight um and i and i think that if it was the other way around going into that fight with what people had sort of sold me as and what they'd sold Cole as i would have been stopped in the sixth round if i was if it was the other way around i'm the young prospect who's who's chinny and gets up off the floor and got no engine i would have been stopped but because Cole was sold as a warrior, fights on forever, gets you in the championship rounds. He was given every benefit of the doubt. And I wasn't even given benefit of the doubt. I was just stopped because the hype train that was the build-up for this fight was that Frotch can't lose. I might box smart in the first half of the fight, but I'll get stopped late. Um, I, just, I just think it was um, absolutely bizarre. Howard Foster, in my opinion, is a tremendous referee. Uh, he's gone on to show that. World-class referee, nice human being as well. Um, I think the fight was stopped, you know, a bit early, to say the least. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I was happy with Carl because, you know, he, he'd come through an onslaught um, and, and turned and turned it around. The Look, the beauty of it is, is um, if the fight carried on, what the outcome would have been. I know, you know, lots of people have their opinion, and I've got mine. Um, but I think I thought Carl had, t- had, had, t- had turned the fight around and uh, had done it over, you know, the six and s- it's not the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth with some some decent shots and some heavy shots. But at the same time, yeah, it stopped prematurely. The rest of it, who, who knows? But um, I think I know what would have happened. It was stopped too early. It just stopped too early. He wasn't close enough. He didn't see into George's eyes. Um, that's not to say he's a bad ref. Because it happened in front of me and he looked really badly hurt, but also we couldn't, we just presume at that point the ref can see the face of the fire, something we can't, we just see groves like this, you know, on the, on the back. So we're up and we just, I can't believe it. It's over. So you get in the ring, high five and everyone, and then you just start hearing a few boos. And then you think to yourself, oh, Really? Like, was that a bad stoppage? And then you go down and you look over at Adam Smith and Mike Costello and the hands are in the air. You know, you think, oh, wow, okay. Then at that point, I'll start over the next minute just talking to people in the ring. Do you think, what do you think about stoppage? 
Oh, no, no, it's fine. He was gone. Or, no, no, that was a terrible stoppage. And it's like, oh, blimey, okay. So you know when you get out of the ring and the boos are carrying on. And then Frotch gets, you know, announced as the winner. Cheers and boos. Groves gets cheered through the roof, you know. And then you just think, oh. And then you also think, Carl Frotch is probably not the best person to deal with the interview that is about to unfold. So when, when I got into the ring, um, there's a few people jumped in. He, you know, he, he got the stoppage and that. And then, um, and then basically, I, I, th- I thought, right, I'll get to him before he does any in- interviews because I knew, he, you know, it's a bad time to, to say anything. You know, you, you, you're under the cosh for six rounds, proper under the cosh. You've got your way out of it, possibly stopped you know, 30 seconds earlier than it should have been or, you know, George will say shouldn't have been stopped. Um, fair enough. But um, I just thought, if I get to Carl, I'll just make sure he don't do any interviews. But then the ring just got swamped by about 150 people and I couldn't get to him. And then obviously he's done a co- he said a couple of things on, 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 on um, to the media and then the next minute we're getting booed <laughs> as we're going out, the, as we're walking back to the change rooms, he's getting booed. So he's gone in an hero. He's ended up turning it around because um, he's, you know, he's an unbelievable person and fighter. And um, and now he's getting booed. So, yeah, it weren't great. And I think, um, yeah, you know, in, in interviewing fighters when they're in the ring, when the, the emotion of it all, um, it, it's, it, yeah, it's not great. Ladies and gentlemen, one minute and 33 seconds of the ninth round. Groves in no position to defend himself, therefore your winner, and still the WBA and IBF super middleweight champion of the world, the Cobra, Carl Frost. And let's show our appreciation for St. George Groves. What do you make of that ending? Yeah, I thought it was a fair enough stoppage. There was times where, you know, I hit him with two shots at the end, and I felt I had a couple of more free shots on him. And I think when a fighter feels like he's got a free shot on, a, on another fighter, I was lining him up for the right hand, the uppercut went in. I honestly had a free shot on him. He was struggling, he was looking at the floor, his head was turning away. And it's that last shot, that last one shot or two shots that could do some serious damage in this sport. The referee's in there, the referee is six inches away from the, the fighters. And he looks into the fighter's eyes, he looks where the, eye, where, the, where the opponents are looking at the floor, he looks at the composure, and he has to make a split session, second decision. So, you know, you shouldn't be asking the fighter if I thought it should have been stopped. Of course I thought it should have been stopped, and of course George thinks it shouldn't have been stopped. George, how badly hurt were you at the end? He caught me with a good shot, but that should never have been a stoppage. If you look, probably knew enough every round beforehand, I had cold buzz and buzz much heavier. And because he's got this warrior image, I think he got the benefit of doubt a lot of the time. And because for some reason I've got this chinny image, it was stopped prematurely in my opinion. And George Groves played up to the crowd, like you said. He played his part and um, he went from villain to hero because the fight was stopped. I said, yeah, well, the referee's got a job to do and he made the right decision, he stopped it. And everyone booed. And he was like looking up, lapping it up. Put yourself in my shoes. I've been dropped in round one, badly hurt, for the second time my career put that. And then I've been battered for six rounds. Properly battered, beat up. My face was swelled up like the elephant, man. But like, I was in pain. I was cut, bruised, battered, broken nose again. Jaw killing me, teeth hurting, tongue all slashed down the side. I bit my tongue a few times. Headache, elbows killing me, back killing me, hands in pain because I'd hit him. And, um... I'm getting booed and spat at and people throwing coins at me on the way back to the changing rooms. George played a blinder, blinder. I mean, it was very clever, George. Always very clever, particularly in that moment. But it was also a, an interview delivered with his heart, you know, after a brilliant performance. But Frotch was just his normal, stubborn self. No, he was out. He was gone. You know, the boos were coming in, coming in. Um, Because Carl was in there. He felt and believed that Groves was done Um, so you know Carl couldn't believe again 
that he'd been disrespected. This time, not just by George Groves, but by the 20,000 that were in Manchester Arena. You always think like anger or anger will c- come in when you lose and sometimes you think joy will come in when you when you win the big fights. But um, usually the big fights, it's, 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 it's that element of joy with relief. And in this point, it was just pure sadness. Like... Um, felt like a conspiracy it felt like i'd been i'd been i'd been robbed you know felt like i'd been hard done by no one really wants me to win no one in the crowd wanted me to win as i'm ring walking eddie hearn desperately don't want me to win um sky seemed to not be you know particularly fond of of me at this point um they're they're portraying me as obnoxious and um just arrogant uh Frosch obviously definitely doesn't want me to win and um, now the British Boxing Board of Control, who three weeks ago ruled in Adam Boo's favour, have now decided you ain't allowed to win this fight, son, like by hook or by crook. Um, and I don't think that is what it is. I'm not saying it was a conspiracy, but that's that's exactly how I felt at the time. Um, just like, the what's the point? But it, it only lasts for a, a split second, really, or you, because you can't switch off. Like, and certainly at this point, where I'd felt like I'd had to have been one man van, leaf on the front. You know, you're on a mission. The mission wasn't over. The mission was extended. It was so I need to um, think fast, like think on my feet, um, assess the situation, and how do I sort of use this performance as a platform to well, get a rematch because that was you know that's the first thing I thought of right, I, need, I need a rematch I sat on the ring apron I could hear the booze ringing out um, and I thought right how, how do you play this like how do you play this um, the only thing I've got of value at the moment is public support maybe public sympathy um, and I've seen that can get switched off instantly, you know. So you, I've got to create it like from now um, to keep it going, to keep it going as well. Not come across as whingy and whiny, um, which some fighters do, um, and not let anyone else diminish what's what's happened happened tonight. So yeah, we sit on the ring apron. I'm I'm thinking, I hope Cole um, doesn't show me any sympathy or any humility right now because that'll be perfect for me. And he 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 fucks it up. Like he says, I think it was the right stoppage, which he shouldn't have said. He sort of I can't remember exactly what he says, but he finishes it with maybe we'll have the rematch. And at this point, he's really stretching for a bit of sympathy. Um, I remember I was thinking, do I cry? Do I not? Uh, <laughs> I was thinking I don't feel like crying but if I eke out a tear would that would that serve me well it's 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 like it's not what not what, maybe hopefully not what people want to hear but you're so calculated at this point you're like fuck me what I it's, what do I do like what what do I do um so show humility um show a slight air of vulnerability but um, try and nail home the injustice and, cl- and shut people down and close people off. So if you know, Sky say, oh, we think he was, you look like he was, you sure he wasn't getting on you? Absolutely not. No. If Eddie Hearn tries to say the same, and Eddie Hearn's becoming quite a powerful promoter at this point. He's got a, vo- he's got a bigger voice than me. I've got to shut him down. So at this point, I'm not really too fussed about Carl. I'm thinking Carl is sort of dead and buried, like in terms of, commercially in, turn, uh, in the argument here and post fight interview he won't recover from that I need to keep Sky on side and just essentially deliver good content for them because then they'll push the message um, and you know I've got to, I do a lot of work with Sky now I've always got on with the vast majority of people at Sky or at least I hope I have you know, <laughs> they like me um, and I've always tried to deliver them good work I think they knew that at this point and yeah, it was it was more Eddie Hearn, and then thinking, well, what are the, what are the options? And like, you know, I'd, I'd sort of try to 
go through this in microseconds um, in a, in the ring before we sit down and do the interview. So I think this stuff, this is this is gonna go. This bit's gonna go sort of everywhere, go viral, um, as well as trying to deal with um, the grief, like the 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 grief. Like part part of me would love to have gone. Just sat down the ring apron and gone, what a load of effing shit. Fuck you. Fuck you. I knew, fucking how did I not know this was going to happen? Fucking Robert Smith at the board. You can fuck off. This one can fuck off. Because um, that's how I was feeling at the time. Uh, Say, so it's a fucking conspiracy. What's the fucking point in boxing? But I knew that, you know, first of all, I'm upsetting the people you shouldn't upset. Um and that would have gone maybe viral that night, but um, doors would have been shut on me after that. Um, and then it only takes a couple of influential people to say, well, I thought the stoppage was okay. And then I've got nothing. So, um, yeah, I think that, that was that was the initial reaction straight after. Was, And I think for, for a lot of people, they don't like it when I say I'm still, I'm still working. Like, I'm still working, but... You've got you've got to really in the fight game. You know you've got to prom promoters are working after the bell. You know managers are everyone's working after the bell. So why should why should fighters not be working after the bell as well? I actually think George Groves may have had a little result in the fact that it was early, because if it would have gone on and it was a legitimate stoppage, maybe we all had a result that it was a little bit early. Carl Froch, me, George Groves, because Froch Groves too would have never been what it was without the controversy of that stoppage. The rematch would have always been big because of how brilliant Groves was. But in my mind, that fight had turned. Groves was hurt. He was out on his feet, but he weren't quite cooked yet. And I think he probably deserved to stay in there a little bit longer. Mm -hmm.